It's almost time. We're about 54 hours away from the first round of the 2017 NFL Draft, an event that demands three, four, and for some NFL fans, cough, cough, Browns, six months of buildup. Hey, I'm Cameron Wolf, Broncos B reporter with the Denver Post, joined by two great guests, longtime Denver Post sports columnist Mark Kisla and former NFL offensive lineman and current 104.3 radio host Tyler Columbus. Hold up, hold up. Let me put a little bit more respect on your name. Super Bowl 50 yes, champion thank you. Tyler Hello. Columbus. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so should we, res- should we expect some hot takes from a former player and a columnist who gets uh, paid for his takes? I mean, I've been listening to uh, some hot takes from over there towards me for <laughs> yeah. a long time. <laughs> Yeah, trust me, I've been prepped and ready to talk about my hot takes about kids, not the Broncos. You know what they say about payback. Yeah, right, <laughs> but, right. But let's start with your uh, draft day memories. Yes. Was yeah. that a good day for you? Uh, well, I mean, in hindsight, sure. At the time, it felt like my whole world just imploded. Yeah. Uh, you know, of course, I, I wanted to get drafted. I thought I'd get drafted. Uh, I went undrafted, although not without a little bit of uh, excitement in between. In the fourth round, the Seattle Seahawks called me. Uh, I got my whole family there. They're on the clock. They said, hey, we're, we're on the clock. We're picking you. Welcome to the Seattle Seahawks. Uh, so my family and I start throwing confetti and, and partying and hugging. And, it's going to uh, happen. Uh, I, I read that little ticker. Sure enough, it does not say Tyler Columbus. I don't remember who it said, but it wasn't me. They called me again in the sixth round. I said, sorry, something came up. Uh, we got two more picks. We're definitely going to take you. So we said, all right, well, it wasn't the fourth round, but I got drafted. I didn't get drafted at all. <laughs> Man. Well, I got drafted in 1983 by the Denver Post. Yeah, there you go. I, had, I had good typing fingers. Oh, they uh, brought you in with Elway? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. Uh, the, the Broncos got Elway in 83. Right. Post got me. Yeah. I think the Broncos might have done a little bit better. A little yeah, bit, right, a little right. bit, a little bit. I don't have any draft day specific memories, but I do remember the first draft I watched, Eli Manning and Philip Rivers, that 04 draft where they swapped picks. How old were you then, like five? <laughs> the first was, draft, yeah, goodness. Yeah, uh, <laughs> first draft I watched. Yeah, right. Yeah, and yeah. It, it just kind of showed the excitement, the adrenaline of the draft, and maybe this year's draft will be that exciting. Right, right. Yeah, so it, it en- always is. Enough about this memory lane stuff. Let's get into the 2017 NFL draft. We're talking about all all the big picture stuff. The Broncos are picking number 20. We'll talk a little bit about local favorite Christian McCaffrey, and we'll talk about trade up, trade down options. I know, kids, you have your opinion on that. So let's get into the action. First debate topic. Broncos, pick 20. Right. What is going to happen there? Is it all about the offensive lineman? Is it always that. about the offensive well, lineman? Only to us. Only to us. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, I would be shocked if the Broncos uh, did not take an offensive lineman. Uh, although I say that, and, and quite frankly, I would nothing would really totally shock me because there's so many different directions we could go. You know, if Christian McCaffrey were to be in firing range, uh, maybe we move up to get him. Maybe we take him at 20 if he's there. If a linebacker, uh, maybe. Foster or Reddick, if one of those two guys were to fall, I think they both make sense at number 20. Uh, it really could go in a handful of different directions, but clearly offensive tackle is going to be the focal point, and I would still personally expect uh, tackle to be the first one off the board. The first thing that comes to my mind is this, John Elway has done six drafts now, I do believe, yeah. and three times he has moved in that draft, either back in the case of Derek Wolf, mm-hmm. or in the last two years, he's moved up right. for Shane Ray and Paxton Lynch. He'll get so his I, guy. I think he likes the action. I think he's all about that action. Right, right. So, so I think he will try to do one or the other rather than uh, just wait at 20 and see what left tackle falls to him. Yeah, l- like, like Tyler, I think the importance of this team is an offensive line. I've been driving that Garrett Bowles boat for a while, and people have been throwing angry emails and tomatoes at me. No, we can't get a 36-year-old offensive tackle. And I'm like, he's only 24, but <laughs> that's not the point. Um, Tyler, these offensive linemen, everybody's been talking yeah. about these offensive linemen. Bowles, Ramjack, Cam Robinson from Alabama, those are the top three. From a player's perspective, what can you see in these guys, and how difficult is it to transition in year one? Well, that's the real difficulty here uh, with the glaring need that we have at that spot uh, and the expectation that we probably would like to add a starting capable uh, player at left tackle through the draft. Well, hold on now. I mean, look at the tackles that are available in this draft, and when you 
you look at the top three, my personal top three, the way, the way I've got them ranked, I got Cam Robinson as number one, uh, then I go Garrett Bowles as number two, and then I got Ramshack as number three. And when you look at all their film, and trust me, I've looked at a lot of it, if you compare it to the options we have at left tackle right now uh, with Ty and Donald Stevenson and, and Michael, well, I can't tell you as a fact that any of these guys in the draft mm. are better than the guys on our team right now. And if they're not, is that worth a first round draft pick? Maybe not. So and, and, and that's my point. Mm. In the first round, if you're a good football team, the mm. Broncos believe they are a playoff caliber team. Right. Uh, they believe they're still a Super Bowl contender. They believe in that defense. You have to draft for impact. Okay. Not need. If you draft for need, you're going to be sorry more often than not. And I don't pretend to know the technique of these offensive tackles as well as you do. Yeah. But I have. Oh, oh yes, you do pretend. I, well, you do pretend. No, no, this is what I don't pretend yeah, yeah. To, to, yeah. Uh, about is that there are big questions about all three of them, no, and none right. of them are guaranteed day one starters. And that's the last thing the Broncos want to do is to bring your man Garrett Bowles in here and then have him sit and watch on day one. Well, well, I don't think he'll sit and watch, and, and, and I may be wrong. Tyler, Tyler, you are more of a, a decisive, decisive mind on this, but I'm just not comfortable seeing Tyson Braylor or Donald Stevenson at, point, at this point at left tackle. Well, I'll tell you this about Garrett Bowles. Uh, although I got Cam Robinson ranked as my number one, that ranking is based off of who I think is prepared and ready to make an impact on day one. Right. Garrett Bowles, hands down, has the most exciting future to me. Mm -hmm. uh, I think the guy long term is probably going to have the best uh, career of any of these tackles in the bunch. Uh, he's got the best feet. I haven't seen athleticism like that out of that spot in a long time. Uh, and and I think uh, he's got the best potential long term. Could he help a team uh, for a long time? Probably. Matter of fact, I think all three of these guys will have a long, successful career. It's just a matter of can they help you on day one in a spot that we've got such a big hole. That's where I'm not confident, and I think, and I think uh, in the first round pick, I would tend to agree with Mark that uh, you do want a guy that's going to have a bigger impact, more on a more immediate form. If you want one of those left tackles. Mm -hmm. I don't think two of them are going to be gone. Right. They might all be there at number 20. Yeah, they could be. Trade back yeah. four or five slots and get one of them. Well, right? well, well, the problem, I think, with that is the, the supply and demand. And we were talking about this, right. Tyler, earlier. You see guys like Russell Okun making almost $60 million in, in, in free agency. It shows that no matter how good these offensive tackle is, everybody needs one. So if you have an opportunity to get one, you have to go get one. No, and there's the opportunity to me for the Broncos to let other people reach for the left tackle and then better football players fall to you. So Trevor and Paxton are just going to run for their lives, I guess. Easy. <laughs> all right, all right, let's go to the next topic. Uh, let's talk Christian McCaffrey, a local favorite. Everybody's been connecting the Broncos to this guy. Does Elway have to go get Christian McCaffrey? No, he does not. Um, um, but he is a heck of a football player. I've had the great pleasure of seeing him play a number of times in person at Stanford. Uh, he will make you miss. He can catch the ball out of the backfield, and he is a threat, uh, returning a punt. So. He's going to work in this league, yeah. um, whether it's going to be with the Broncos or not. I tend to think it probably won't be, but if, he, if the Broncos were able to make a trade for him or he slipped down the board, they'd be happy with him. I think uh, Chris McCaffrey as a Denver Bronco would make a huge impact on our team probably in ways that nobody else in this draft can. I think that he's the only guy that has the capability outside of a quarterback of winning one or two games by himself. So do I want him as a Denver Bronco? Darn right I do. Do I think he will be? I do not. Uh, I think that his stock has risen so high he's going to be out of reach for the Broncos more than likely. You know, three months ago people were discussing whether he was a second rounder mm -hmm. or a first rounder. Now now the discussion is, is he going to make it outside the top 10 or not? And I don't think the Broncos are going to be willing to go much higher than that. I think the sweet spot for Christian McCaffrey is going to be somewhere in that 13 to 14 range. Indianapolis and Philadelphia are two of the most interested teams in them. They, they pick back to back. And if the Broncos want Christian McCaffrey, I think they're going to have to make a move with one of those teams and hope that they're willing to, one of those two teams is willing to not pick him and maybe trade that pick to the Broncos if they really do want. 
on him. If he makes, if he falls, slides to the middle of the first round, mm-hmm. then you, the Broncos could give up their first, and they could give up a third rounder and yeah. get him. Yeah. And at that point, I think you got to go get him. But I think you're right. That it's more likely that he's going eight, yeah. maybe eleven. Yeah. And to get to jump up there. Then it's the first rounder and the second rounder, and I can't see John Elway giving away. It's a lot of firepower. Yeah, yeah. yeah. a lot I, of firepower. I agree. I mean, like you said, Philly and Indy are there. Carolina's a little bit be- above Cincinnati right. at nine. You got New Orleans, even though they just picked up AP at eleven. There's a lot of teams out there that need running backs, and I'm of the opinion that running backs are still a position where you can wait and get good talent for. Although Christian McCaffrey does have a skill set that's more than a running back, you look at, okay, I may be able to get an Alvin Kamara in round two, a Christian, uh, Curtis Samuel in round two, even a guy like a Donnell Pumphrey in round four or five that can do uh, you know, a, a mini version of what Christian McCaffrey can do and get another player in round one or two and not have to give up that second round pick next year or something like at that. At the NFL level, he can take it to the house anytime he touches the ball. So, I mean, you got to love that. Yeah. I have two questions about him for right. both of you. Is he too little? Is he so little that he's even a higher risk of getting hurt? That's one. And, and second, Stanford used the heck out of him. Right. And, yeah. I, and I don't like running backs with a lot of wear on Trade, those tires. Yeah. Yeah. Well, so are, are you concerned or no? Well, I think that those questions sort of answer answer each other. Uh, okay. is, is he little? Maybe. Uh, but the amount of workload that he went under at Stanford, man, I was watching that and thinking, gosh, they're going to run this guy into the ground. I mean, they are just handing him the ball every single down, right? Mm-hmm. And he, for the most part, survived all of that. Uh, you know, no major injury concerns going coming into the draft. Has he had injuries? Sure. Uh, is there anything that anybody's dinging him for? No. And I think if there were injury concerns, that would have exposed itself during a college career where he got used so much. So it does not concern me, no. I think, honestly, that you can't look at Christian McCaffrey as an as an old-style running back where you're going to get 25 to 30 carries out of him a game. I think if you're using Christian McCaffrey, use him sort of like Atlanta, use Tevin Coleman um, where he may get 10 to 15 carries a game. He's a dynamic threat out of the backfield where you can throw him the ball five to seven times a game. Um, and if he's honestly as important of a weapon as people play him, you're probably not going to use him as a returner. So you're looking at him as an 18 to 20 touch, whether it's pass or running back, and a guy that can potentially be a game changer. So is he Sproles? Is he Woodhead? Is he more than that? Uh, I think he has the potential to be more than that. I would not be shocked if he is used in the kind of light that you are painting there. Uh, I, that would not surprise me. I think that if he gets on a team that has an established starter, that's probably how he will be used. But he definitely has every every capability of being uh, uh, between the tackles workhorse that you hand the ball off to, I don't know, 25, 30 times, and he can get it done. Okay, so so we talked about Denver and, and their possibility to get him. Say he doesn't get there. Sure. Say if it doesn't happen, 20 doesn't work. What's the best fit for him? And, and ultimately, what's his ceiling in the NFL? Well, uh, you guys brought up Darren Sproles, and I know for a fact that Philadelphia is one of the teams that is most interested in Christian McCaffrey. I think that they know how to utilize a player like Christian, uh, and I would be shocked if, he's, if, he, if he gets to Philadelphia when they're on the clock. If he makes it past them, I'm going to be very surprised, and I think they would use him very well. Five seconds, Mark. Because I'm a simpleton, I'll keep it simple. Throw it to him more than you hand him. Hand him the football. Fine, yeah. fine. Yeah. I mean, he yeah. might be the best slot receiver in the draft. Right. You know? All right. Yeah. So, so let's examine out of the box options. Say the Broncos don't stay at twenty in the draft. You mentioned trading up, trading down. We've seen that for Elway. He's a mover. What's the best fit for him? Moving up for somebody, and if so, who? Or moving down and collecting more picks. My idea is this: if you if you're moving up, you're going to to get a guy that scores touchdowns for you. Yeah. Uh, whether it's McCaffrey and the guy I like even better is O.J. Howard because I think Howard as a tight end gives your young quarterbacks an easy target, especially in the red zone, and that's something the Broncos were missing last season and they were missing it two seasons ago in Peyton Manning's last year. So if they can get up to 15, 12, maybe even 10, but 10 is going to cost you a first and a second round pick. Yeah. I'm interested in Howard. If you're going to take one of the offensive linemen, I think the best offensive lineman, I am pretending here, <laughs> but, but I think the best offensive lineman, my guess, and it's only a guess, is the guard from Western Kentucky, Forest Lamp. Forest Lamp. Guards 
don't have the cachet of tackles. Right. Um, right. Yeah. Well, and not as athletic or right. as good looking. Yeah. Yeah. So, and he has yeah. alligator arms. Yeah. And he has short little arms. Yeah. He's not a model <laughs> easy, like you easy, are. Easy. I had the shortest arms at the combine <laughs> okay. in my class. All right, we can survive. Okay. We can survive. Okay, so, so uh, let me go here. If you want Lamp, then you hope that he's behind you and you can trade back and get an extra pick. But now that you, you brought it up, Short arms. Right, right. <laughs> Does it matter? Jeff Davidson I mean, loves length. I mean, I mean, you can uh, be president not, with small hands. Well, can you be a tackle with well, short cer arms? Certainly you can overcome. I played eight years, uh, and I had the shortest arms at the combine my my rookie year. Uh, do I think I would have been a better player if I had longer arms? Absolutely. Yeah. yeah, I mean, it was a disadvantage that I had to learn techniques of how to overcome it. Uh, certainly if you're a great athlete, it's, it's not something that's going to hold you back from having success. But it's easier. I mean, if I can reach you before yeah. you can reach me, well, that's advantage me, you know? So uh, it's just basic science there. It helps. Uh, I think a couple guys outside of Christian McCaffrey that would be intriguing for the Denver Broncos, Reuben Foster, uh, he's probably going to be there at number 20 now mm -hmm. based off of uh, what happened at the Combine when he got kicked out, uh, and, and then he had the diluted sample uh, for his drug test. Those two things is probably going to push him back. He'll probably be available at number 20, and I think if he is, the Denver Broncos think long and hard about him. They probably even take him. Uh, you know, then there, there's so many tight ends in this draft. Mm -hmm. I think the Denver Broncos are going to draft probably two tight ends. Really? Uh, that, that's how good this tight end class is, and we've got a need for it. I think we're probably going to get two tight ends. I doubt if it comes in the first round, though, because there's so many guys that can help you, and why spend a first round pick if there's others out there? Okay, I, I, let me jump in on Foster real quick. If he drops because of the, the diluted sample yeah. and the combine hoo-ha right. right yeah um you didn't want to wait around you know who does yeah yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. um as long as his shoulders check out okay that's a no-brainer at 20 well, for me. Well, 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 yeah, yeah. Yeah. well here's here's my issue with that um how many red flags do you take and that goes into elway's philosophy where he sort of has you know made his mark on taking a little bit of character guys bradley roby yeah. had the you know the ovi and and shane ray had the marijuana um but Ruben Foster, he's got the he's got a anger streak for the heated confrontation for waiting around. He's got the shoulder injuries. Right. He's got the failed drug tests. At some point, you got to say, hey man, this guy might be more trouble than than this work. Oh. Sounds a little bit like a linebacker to me as well. Like, <laughs> sorry man, right. I'm out of here. Yeah. But but um, if he's healthy, mm -hmm. I'm taking him. I mean, he doesn't have Joe Mixon anger issues. Yeah. Well, uh, well, you know, Joe Mixon very well could be in the picture for the Denver Broncos. I think he very well there, could be. There's no one-size-fits-all answer to your question about yeah. the red flags. It always depends on what is the red flag, how good is your team, and how uh, how quality are the guys in your locker room? Can they help you to handle guys with some red flag issues? I do think the Broncos' history of taking those guys the last couple of years is probably going to encourage them that if we feel okay about those red flags, if they're in our comfort zone for, as far as red flags go, well, they very well might take another guy. Real quick, you comfortable picking Joe Mixon one word? Mm. No. I, I, there's a lot of ways to win the Super Bowl. Um, I'm not going to deny his right to make a living, but I'm not going to hand him Pat Bowen's money either. Yeah, I probably would not pick him, but that being said, uh, you know, this league is about talent, and talent does overcome most off the field incidents, right or wrong. That's just what happens. And will he play in the NFL? Yeah, he will. And uh, will the Denver Broncos consider him if he's available in the second round when the Broncos are on the clock? Darn right they will. I won't be shocked if Joe Mixon is a Denver Bronco. Uh, it is one of those incidents, though, that, you know, where's your line? And yeah. wait, once they cross it, you know, can you can you touch him? Yeah. Well, for a lot of people, he crossed that line. Yeah, I agree. And I think he's a second round pick. I think he's the best back in this class. And like we saw with Tyreek Hill, if you don't have him, ultimately he's going to beat you. So you got to make your decision one way. Or well, that's the other. right. Yeah. yeah. And that's going to make Broncos fans fearful that they're missing out on another Tyreek Hill. It yeah. is because Tyreek. Now I understand that. Yeah. Okay. So let's get into this. We've talked about the three topics. Prediction time. Right. We'll give each guy 15 to 20 seconds. What are you doing on draft day if you're John? John Elway and why? 
All right, I'll go first. <laughs> you know, I think, uh, it, do, I, do I get a qualifier of who's available or no? You, because you, you, you can, yeah, it changes. You know, I do think the Broncos are going to take a tackle with their first pick. I don't like taking the, the easy pick uh, because that's normally what happens in these mock drafts. They just take the, the biggest need. Mm -hmm. uh, well, in this case, I do think it's probably going to be accurate. But my prediction is going to change based off of if one guy's off the board or if no guys are off the board because uh, – uh, if one or two of the tackles have been picked, we're picking a tackle at number 20 and we're staying there. But if there's two guys left, I bet you we move back a little bit and then try to get him later in the first round. Okay. They don't call me Mr. Sunshine for nothing. <laughs> I'm the eternal optimist. A playmaker there they like is right. going to be there at 12, 14, 15. Mm -hmm. Elway's going to do everything in his power to trade up. Broncos are going to get O.J. Howard or Christian McCaffrey. Oof. If that doesn't work... At 20, I'm still the eternal optimist. My man Reuben Foster is going to drop. He's going to be there. And if uh, it's not as happy as I am, the situation, they'll move back and take an offensive lineman. I love O.J. Howard. I, I, I don't think Elway values uh, inside linebackers as much as you do. Yeah. Um, ultimately, I, I agree with Tyler. I think they stay put and get an offensive tackle. Garrett Bowles, I've been on that boat since the beginning. I think they <laughs> you got to write a boring pick about how you know they're doing that. But I, th I think you've got to get a left tackle in this league. If you're going to be a contender, you've got to get a guy, whether it's a guy you still have to work on, still have to mold. I think you have to get a guy to protect your blind side or you're not going to be successful. Okay, I just have one question for both of you. Mm -hmm. Maybe more so the bigger guy than the smaller guy. Mm -hmm. The Broncos won Super Bowl 50. They, there was a tackle on that team that made a major contribution. Who could that be? Where did they get him from? <laughs> did they get him in the draft? Right. I think he was walking the streets of Atlanta. Yeah, I sure was. Yeah, I, I was walking the streets after I got cut by Atlanta. That's what I was doing. Yeah, you're darn right. Uh, I think that ship sailed, though. That, sh that, that sailed about 55 pounds ago. Okay, and you're looking good. But my point is, is you made a major contribution right. to that team. And they didn't go to the draft to find a tackle that can help you win the Super Bowl. And I will tend to agree with you on this. I, as much as it pains me to say it, I think that playmakers win championships, not yeah. offensive linemen. Yeah. And it, a lot of teams can have success with average offensive lines. I was a part of top five offenses, top five rushing offenses in Seattle and Washington. And our offensive lines were certainly not top tier. Uh, we had a ton of success because we worked as a unit. We had great coaching and we had phenomenal running backs. Uh, so that helped us to overcome a lot of deficiencies. So, and, and I don't think you can hide a lack of playmakers. You might be able to hide a lack of uh, quality offensive linemen. No, I, I think that's a good point. And maybe you opened up my eyes a little bit on not having to go offensive tackle. The problem is if you don't get them in round one, you're not going to get a guy that can play at all beyond that. And I think you can get playmakers that might can play that might in round true. two, You three, might four. get a long-time offensive tackle in the league as a free agent. You just know. <laughs> if you're lucky. Yeah. You if might be lucky. able to talk me to come back. Give me a couple donuts, you know. You're not too far away, are you? And let me hit up to Paul and get some donuts. You know, I'll be back. Okay, so we'll talk. take some questions from fans. Okay. Um, we had enough debate. We'll take some of you guys' questions. Keep turning them in on Facebook Live. I'll read a few that we have up, and you guys send them in, and we'll choose whichever one sounds nice. Um, so we got... Two questions coming in around a similar topic from Caleb Tonko and Donald Stearman, um, both action about tight ends, They're the tight end class, the good tight end class. So we mentioned O.J. Howard. Um, I know you like David and Joku as well. Um, what do we see in that? How big of a need is that for the Broncos? Um, and and what, where do we see? I know you mentioned two tight ends being Yeah, well, selected. well, we don't have a pass catching tight end on our roster right now. Yeah. A.J. Derby did a fine job for us once he came into town. Uh, is he the answer long term? No. Uh, we need a pass catching tight end. And if you're looking for a pass catcher, this is the draft to get him in. Elway talked about it yesterday. There's a lot of F tight ends, not necessarily Y tight ends. And the difference between those two is your Y is your more old school, uh, bruising, blocking tight end. And your F is your more uh, Jordan Reeds, Julius, uh, those type of guys. Those are, the, those are the new trend in the NFL. And quite frankly, I'm of the new breed. I'm of the new era that I'm okay with that. 
uh, I'm okay with having a tight end that can't block. Mm -hmm. uh, if I just know that you're a mismatch on third down, hey, I'm good with it. And there's a lot of guys out there. there but there's some other guys that are a little bit more well-rounded as well. Adam Shaheen, mm -hmm. he, he's six foot seven, 280 People pounds. People call him next Gronk. <laughs> right. Yeah, you know, there's a lot of guys out there. So I, I would predict that we get two guys, and I would predict that one of them is probably a wide receiver in a tight end's body. Yeah, I think you're right. There's a bunch of Fs, like like uh, like uh, Elway mentioned, that are in the yeah. draft that can make sense in those middle rounds. And Elway mentioned third, fourth, fifth round guys like your Bucky Hodges from right. Virginia Tech, your, your Jordan Leggett from Clemson. And guys like that that can make an impact down the field, down the seam, guys that are had that Julius Thomas type role yeah, where right. you're saying, okay, he's not going to block a soul. Okay. He's going to let everybody run by, but if we can get that threat down the field, maybe everybody, every pass won't have to be the DT and E. And as long know? as I know what I'm getting into, that's okay. I right. mean, if I've, got the, if I've got the blocker on my team, I can live with the guy that doesn't block as long as he's a, mis a mismatch on third down. Thank you, thank you, thank you. <laughs> you just went on and on and on about the Broncos' biggest offensive need. And you said it earlier, do not be surprised if they take two tight ends right. in this draft. Right. Um, we have another question coming in from Nick. Um, I'll just say B. I don't want to mispronounce your name, my man. Um, any downside about Foster other than off the field? Shoulder concerns. Mm -hmm. And, you know, if you're a linebacker, you probably use your shoulder a little bit. But I do watch a lot of couch football because yeah. I was born in South Bend, Indiana, and I've never gotten over that. Right. Um, he's the best defensive player I've saw last year period yeah. and 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 Alabama has what at least three legitimate first round draft choices from the defensive side of the ball yeah and, 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 to and me, he's I, the best one I, I agree but that in its sense is, is a reason why I think there may be more to that the Alabama title for their defenders are so much talent out there it's easy to be hidden um, in that group. If you've got three NFL defensive linemen in front of you, it's easy to make a lot of plays as a linebacker when everything's clear. you got Jonathan Allen, who may be a top five pick, who's opening up lanes. Uh, Dalvin Tomlinson. This guy. Don't we, this, Dalvin Tomlinson, who this, I love. This, this, guy, this guy is the real deal. Okay. He, he's a surefire bet. I really do believe that. I hate player comparisons from uh -huh. college guys to NFL guys because yeah, it very rarely works out that way. But I've seen a lot of comparisons of Foster to Ray Lewis, and quite frankly, you know, if somebody's uh, performance on the field deserves a reference like that, a comparison like that, it might just be this guy. You remember Super Bowl 50? Yeah. Did Carolina have pretty good linebackers? They right. did. Right. They didn't win, though. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Pretty good. Let's go to the next question. I, I, now that you beat me up. <laughs> All right. So we got this uh, this next question from Aaron um, asking why bowls over Ryan Ramchek? Um and I think. For, for you, you had Cam Robinson, Bowles, and then uh, Ramshack is your top. Um, yeah. What do you think? Well, l let me clarify that just one more time. My, my rankings is based off the guys that I think are prepared to make an impact on day one. So I think that Cam Robinson is the most prepared to come in and play on day one. Mm -hmm. uh, I think Garrett Bowles is the most exciting prospect in the draft. He also is a, a bit of a project. You know, he's, he's, he hasn't played much football. He's got some red flag concerns. So does Ram. A lot of these guys have red flag. All three of those guys, to yeah. some degree, have something out there. Right. Uh, I think that Garrett Bowles, though, he separates himself from everybody else based off his feet and his athleticism. And for me, I made my living with my feet. Mm -hmm. I was never the strongest guy in the world. I was never going to move guy, guys five yards off the spot. I was going to beat them from point A to point B, to point B and use my athleticism. Uh, I like what I see him in, a, in him a lot because he's got that athleticism at 300 pounds. I think he can still put on another 12 to 15 and keep that athleticism and still be fit in a, a good fit in a power scheme like the Broncos are now going to employ. I, I agree and I, I think a lot of times I hear people when I say that I want Garrett Bowles for the Broncos say he's a reach, he's a reach. Yeah. But I don't think he's a reach at 20 because of you know, nah, he is. He every, is. everybody yeah. talks about projection and I think every player has projection. Right. You're coming from college you know maybe the offensive line transition is more difficult but there's no player that's going to come in and say hey this is just as easy 
easiest college. Yeah. It's all a projection. You got to get them in a strength and conditioning program, get a little bit of stronger, but you can't teach those feet. You can't teach that athleticism. No, and, and you can't teach that nasty streak that he has. Well, it's only a reach if it doesn't work out. You know, yeah. if a guy works out, nobody's ever a reach. Uh, right. <laughs> but the reality is, if you're just going off of uh, discipline scouting grades, which, you know, I don't always uh, concern myself with because I overcame those grades of myself. Mm -hmm. But if you are going by the scouting grades, all three of those guys would be a bit of a reach at number 20. Okay. If he's the best player on the board, take him. And if you, he's it's not, not always that simple. It's though. not, it's I, not it always is that simple. That simple no, in the first BPA round. Is a no, myth. no, it's a it's a myth. I think I think if you think Paxton Lynch was Ruben the Foster, the best player Bowles, on their board, if you take Listen. Garrett Poles, I'll never Here, forget it. Here's how here's how it works. <laughs> BPA is not a myth. Uh, position of needs not a myth either. Right. Uh, they're both real, and a BPA would be the most simple, ideal way to approach it every single time. But when you've got a glaring hole as big as the left tackle spot or a quarterback spot, then position of need all of a sudden starts to creep into that into the factor. And you got two circles here, right? Where do they collide, and how big is that overlap? And that's where you decide okay, let's keep what the ratio is. Foster or Bowles? Your choice. Foster. I'm taking Bowles. Foster. Yeah, foster. Uh, there's too many red flags to me. I'm agreeing too much with Mark today. <laughs> 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 all right, all right. Yeah. Something's last, wrong. Yeah, last, something's the, very this wrong. This world is upside down. <laughs> we'll, we'll take one last question, okay. and then we'll end this question from Bree asking about two different playmakers. Um, Corey Davis and David Njoku, Njoku tight ends, um, are those potential picks, and how would you see those guys fitting in? Do you see them taking Njoku at 20? I wouldn't be shocked by it. Yeah. I, I think ultimately he's he's an F, like you mentioned, whereas O.J. Howard is a Y. Um, so you've got to say, do we spend a number 20 pick on an F receiver who's limited? He's a playmaker, high upside, young guy. He, he immediately become your your third best uh, receiver and playmaker on the team. But is that too high for him? I think it may be. Uh, okay. What? I mean... You can't trust any general manager the week of the draft. Right. I mean, they right. wouldn't be doing their job if they told you That's everything right. they were That's thinking. Right. But the thing I th thought I detected in Elway in his draft conversation with the media this week was if I'm going to get a receiving tight end, I can get the receiving tight end later. later. Mm -hmm. And sure. so that's, fair. Uh, that's that's what I think. So you tell me who are the receiving tight ends in two, three, round four, and that's that's where the Broncos will get their tight end if they don't trade up. Yeah, I think and you're right. Fill, fulfill my dream of O.J. Howard. I think you're right, and that's some of the guys we mentioned, Bucky Hodges, you know, your Gerald, Gerald Everett, your Jordan Leggett. Some of those guys will be there second, third, fourth round, and, and they may be able to give you just as much immediately as Njoku. So that's, uh, that's it for, for questions for us. Uh, we hope you guys enjoyed the chat. It was a lot of fun, and we hope to do it, uh, do it again soon. Special thanks to Tyler. Um, and Mark for coming on to join us in the show. We'll be giving, uh, giving you guys heavy draft coverage over the next week and the weekend um, at DenverPost.com, Black Sash Broncos. Check us out on Twitter. All our handles are below. Um, um, so for Tyler, Kiz, and myself, thanks for joining us. Thank you, Goldie.